Hi, I'm Leslie, and this is the Shapes of Epidemics and Global Disease video series. I'm here with Professor Crummett. Would you like to introduce yourself, Professor? Hi, I'm Lisa Crummett, and I'm an Associate Professor of Biology at Soka University of America. Thank you, Professor. Now, for your chapter of the Shapes of Epidemics and Global Disease titled Industry's Role in the Metabolic Disease Pandemic, what would you say is your research topic? I was interested in um, examining the major role of sugar in promoting metabolic disease. And I'm also interested in looking at how uh, big multinational food and beverage corporations have influence over this information and are trying to kind of keep this information from the general public. First thing to point out is that we are in fact experiencing a global pandemic of metabolic disease around the world. It's not just something experienced in the US. Metabolic syndrome is a, a term that's coined for describing a cluster of diseases that tends to travel in people. And the diseases include um, high blood pressure, uh, increased visceral fat around the belly, hyperlipidemia, and insulin resistance. And these diseases tend to promote cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer around the world, and also type 2 diabetes. And so my chapter mainly focuses on insulin resistance, uh, also called prediabetes, and type 2 diabetes. And mainly because this is really the gateway to metabolic syndrome. That's kind of the first thing that goes wrong in an individual is insulin resistance. And then you have all these other problems that start to pop up. I wanted to first convey that there's strong evidence uh, for the association between consuming a lot of added sugars in our diet and insulin resistance, and as well as metabolic disease in general. I go through some of the scientific evidence in my chapter. Um, so I'll convey a little bit of that first to kind of make sure everybody's aware that when I'm talking about added sugars, I'm talking about extrinsic sugar. So this is sugar that is found um, really in processed foods, mainly in beverages. Uh, so the sugar that's found in fruits and vegetables is called intrinsic sugar and it's encased in fiber and it has a very different effect on our metabolism as opposed to extrinsic or added sugar. With added sugar, the, the main component that is so detrimental to our metabolism is fructose. Table sugar is called sucrose um, and both table sugar and high fructose corn syrup are going to be about half glucose and half fructose. But fructose is much more potent at causing uh, insulin resistance than glucose is, and we have a lot of evidence for that. And so the main reason is because about 95% of fructose is metabolized solely by our liver. Whereas with glucose, all of the cells in our body are able to take it in and metabolize it, mainly the liver that metabolizes fructose. So when we have that milkshake or that soda, our liver gets bombarded with fructose, fructose overload. And so what it ends up doing is uh, converting a lot of that to fat. You get this excess fat production in our liver cells and that leads to insulin resistance uh, in the liver and inflammation causing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and then the excess fat that that liver produces also gets into our blood, of course, and it travels through the body in these little lipoproteins called very low density lipoproteins or VLDLs. And uh, those are gonna contribute to cardiovascular disease as well as insulin resistance in our skeletal muscles. So insulin resistance is when our cells don't listen to insulin anymore, or they don't do a very good job of listening to insulin. And insulin is the signal that tells our cells to take in glucose and use it or store it as fat or glycogen. So without that insulin signal, you have glucose building up in the blood. And that's what we see in those with insulin resistance or prediabetes as well as, as diabetes. Fructose, again, is very potent at causing insulin resistant, resistance in both the liver and our skeletal muscle. And then there's a lot of downstream effects from that. Our pancreas tries to overproduce insulin to compensate for the fact that our cells aren't listening to insulin. And so all 
of this overproduction of insulin has its own negative effects. Um, it kind of puts your body in this, uh, what's called orexigenesis or starvation mode, where you're constantly producing and storing fat. Your, metab your metabolic rate goes down, so you feel tired and lethargic, and you tend to crave uh, high cal calorie fattening foods, right? Many years of insulin resistance and overproducing insulin by the pancreas leads to type two diabetes, which is when the pancreas stops producing um, insulin or reduces its production of insulin. And that has its own problems. That's a little background about the connection between um, sucrose and metabolic disease, particularly insulin resistance. The second part of my chapter looks at how the food and beverage industries don't want you to know this. They don't want you to know that there's a toxin that they're putting in your foods that's highly addictive, that makes you want to keep coming back and consuming that food product. At the same time, it's slowly making you very sick. The five tactics that the food and beverage industry use to kind of cover up this information are they, one, they try and attack the science that's out there and discredit it. They spread misinformation. They deploy industry funded scientists where the scientists are saying what they want them to say because they're giving them millions of dollars. And we can see this when you look at the, there's a statement of conflict of interest at the end of every journal article um, that says, do you have a conflict of interest? These papers that state that there's no connection between sugar and metabolic disease will often say, there's a conflict of interest. I've received money from Kraft or Nestle or Coca-Cola, right? And then the last thing is to undermine policy. Um, there's a, tremendous lobbying power by the food and beverage industries to influence government and to influence policy making. And so those are kind of the different ways that um, this information that should be so important that everybody should be getting about sugar and metabolic disease is, is not making it through to the general public. I kind of close the chapter by saying that there's, you know, things that we can do to try and change the tide, to try and change our current disease trajectory. And that is mainly by doing what was done to the tobacco industry about 50 years ago, where we really highlight the fact that there's so much corporate money that's infiltrating our government and academia, and that we have to get take that corporate money out of government and out of academia so that people get the right message, the right information, and that they can make the right choices about what they're eating and what they're putting into their body. Because tobacco was demonized uh, through a huge public health campaign, we can do the same thing with sugar. And we can try and get sugar out of schools and out of the workplace and try and restrict access but also try and increase access and affordability to alternative foods that are healthy, that, will, that don't cause disease and try and make it affordable to everybody. And so there are things that we can do, but we have to make sure we elect the right uh, legislatures that are gonna make those things happen. And that requires public pressure. And to get that public pressure, people need to know this information. This information has to get out there. So why would you say your research topic in this chapter is important and relevant? It's really important because of where we're at right now with this metabolic disease pandemic. About one third of adults in the United States have insulin resistance or prediabetes already. And within the next 10 years or so, it's predicted that more than half of U.S. adults are going to have insulin resistance, which leads to type 2 diabetes. So it's a huge problem and it's got a huge um, death toll associated with it as well as a reduction in the quality of life. Um, so the CDC actually ranked uh, type 2 diabetes as being the seventh leading cause of death. But what's interesting is um, on your death certificate, you know, you might have died from complications of diabetes and it doesn't actually list diabetes. Like for instance, diabetes is one of the main causes of chronic kidney disease. 
So on your death certificate, it's going to say chronic kidney disease and not diabetes. So for that reason, there was this really cool study that came out where they looked at all of this data from the National Health Interview Survey, as well as the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And from that data, the authors uh, determined that it's about the third leading cause of death in the United States. This information is super important that we get out there. Like if you go to diabetes websites, they'll say the main cause is obesity, overweight, and being like leading a sedentary lifestyle. Those aren't actually the causes of diabetes. Those are just symptoms. So one of the things that happens when you have insulin resistance and you have really high insulin levels because of that is you feel lethargic. Uh, your satiety hormone is blocked to the brain, which tells you you're full and you don't need to eat anymore. So keep on eating, right? And so that leads to being overweight. Um, you're also in this orexigenesis mode where high insulin causes your body to store excess fat. This is really a result of the biochemistry. It's a result of what happens when you consume too much fructose, right? Um, but instead, diabetes websites say that the cause is obesity, right? Or the cause is, you know, being lethargic. If you were looking at allergies and you were looking at allergies to, let's say, pollen, right? And you were trying to figure out what's the cause of the fact that I'm sneezing all the time and I'm congested and I have watery eyes. And someone says, oh, the cause of your congestion is the fact that you have watery eyes because they occur together, right? They travel together. So one must cause the other which is ludicrous, right? They're all just symptoms of the fact that your body's having a huge immune response to pollen, the antigen pollen, right? So really the cause is the pollen. It's not the fact that you have watery eyes, right? That's just a symptom. But instead of saying that the cause of type two diabetes has to do with what we're eating, particularly a high sugar diet, uh, instead they're saying it's, it's because of the obesity, right? Which is just crazy to me. I teach a class on this every year and try and spread the information to my students so that they can tell their friends and their family members. And I, I hope that people read this book chapter and get a better understanding of how to avoid this very, very serious um, metabolic disease pandemic that we're, we're experiencing. Thank you so much, Professor Kremer. Your, your chapter for, this, for the shapes of epidemics and global disease is really eye-opening as well as this interview. Now, I really appreciate you taking the time to join the video series. So thank you so much, Professor Crumb. Thank you. Thank you.